guys look great. This event's uh, just an event for fun, um, using basic materials, which is cardboard and duct tape. Cardboard and duct tape. <laughs> Whose brainchild was this anyways? No experience necessary, plus, you know, cardboard and duct tape, you can just find those in the garage. It's, it's, uh, we were here last year for the first year and saw what fun everyone was having, so we had to come back again this year, but this time we brought our sleds. You're never too old to be That's silly. That's right, and have fun. Good, clean fun. <laughs> I want to have fun. You what? I want to have fun. I don't care. You don't care? I love it. I love it. <laughs> What's up with the helmets? Those are They're BBs. BBs. They're what? They're BBs. BBs. Oh. One of the shotguns, too. What we need to do is make sure my hair does not get wet. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the official duct tape and cardboard sled race. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Ten, not pilot error? No. no we would like to play the uh, rubber ducky theme song as we take the podium. <laughs> well, this guy decided to say lean, and when we lean, we turn around the other way. So. We lean too far. All right, man, get up and walk it off. You're fine. During the heyday of coal mining here in the Nuevo Gorge between the 1870s and the 1950s, you could find a coal mine every half a mile up and down the Nuevo Gorge. The town of Nuttleburg is named for John Nuttall, and he was the second person to ship coal out of the Nuevo Gorge. He knew that the railroad was coming through, and so he wanted to be in place to be able to capitalize on that. And Nuttleburg started in the 1870s when the CNO Railroad was building the railroad through the Nuevo Gorge and that enabled all these mines to get started to ship their coal out to fuel the Industrial Revolution. But what makes Nuttleburg significant is its connection to Henry Ford. And so in 1920, he purchased Nuttleburg in order to, to bring coal up to his factories up in Detroit. Unfortunately, he found that he couldn't control the prices that the CNO Railroad were charging him. Even the mighty Henry Ford couldn't afford to buy the CNO Railroad, and so he sold out his interests here in about 1928. So most of what you see at Nuttleburg today dates from around the 1920 era when Henry Ford owned it. It was always of interest to the National Park to be able to have this place to interpret. It wasn't until 1998 that the site was actually purchased from the Nuttall heirs. And over the last 10 to 15 years has been an ongoing process of restoration. We're standing underneath the tipple, which is what sorted all of the coal to put it onto the coal trains underneath. Uh, above us there is the conveyor, which brought all the coal down from the coal seam up in the mountain and brought it down into this uh, tipple above us here. People are really surprised when they come here and they don't, they don't expect it to be quite this, I guess, massive. And I think it's kind of a hidden treasure in some ways. I, I like to tell people if you went to the Beckley Exhibition coal mine in the morning and you came to Nuttleburg in the afternoon, you would really understand how coal mining worked in southern West Virginia, where you can see the railroad tracks right next to us. You can see where the coal mine was. You can see for the foundations for all the families that live down here. You can really get a great sense of how this all operated. There's really not many other places in the country where you can get a good sense of how a coal mining operation worked, and it's right here in our backyard, and we're really lucky to have it.
14 years ago, Darren found this perfect place to fish and we were expecting with Elizabeth and decided it'd be a perfect place for me to relax and he could fish all day. We've started with uh, just a couple of cabins and now 10 years later we have 14 cabins and six lodge rooms and we have everything from mini cabins that accommodates two people to the larger two-story cabins that accommodates eight. The most unique thing on Elk Springs is the year-round fly fishing. Fish rise all day long, uh, perfect limestone in the water where it goes to the caves, so the pH is right on the water, so you have a strong bug life, strong hatches. Every night you can pretty much depend on a bug hatch. The trout thrive in the cold water, uh, especially in the summertime, good oxygen levels, and lots of bugs, and the trout just feel good. One of the best things about Oak Springs is the restaurant. We have daily specials, outdoor barbecues, live entertainment. I wish more kids my age would, you know, get into fly fishing and come up here. People don't know what they're missing by not coming to Oak Springs. The fly shop is upstairs of the restaurant. It's a 40 by 80. We have the largest fly selection on the East Coast, over a thousand different patterns of flies. This is a fly fisherman's heaven. You can, you can buy anything that you need, and at the same time you can walk out on the balcony and look at the famous uh, mill pool and watch the trout rise all day long. People use it for all sorts of things other than fly fishing. They, they come here for reunions. We've had lots of weddings, and a lot of people use it as a central location if they're going to a lot of the other beautiful places that West Virginia has to offer. It's only about 13 miles from the base of Snowshoe. Elk Springs is not a private resort. Anybody can come in and go out to the Elk River and, and go fishing. It's a family thing for us. It, it is our second home. It's our home away from home. And yes, it's a business, but it, it's more than that. It's, we come up here to get away. That is why people come to Elk Springs Resort. They want to get away and just enjoy beautiful West Virginia. We're here at Group Mountain Battlefield State Park, West Virginia's very first state park, established in 1828. This is the site of a Civil War battle, November 6, 1863, which is generally considered the last significant battle in West Virginia. The new state of West Virginia was formed in June of 1863, but was a state in name only. This battle in November, five months later at Group Mountain, finally drove Confederates out. Almost all the people that fought here were West Virginians. So numerous cases of fathers, sons, uncles, nephews. So this is a site where it, that brother against brother thing of the Civil War was, was really a real uh, issue. We have trenches um, out uh, where on the left, what was the left flank of the Confederate Army. Uh, just shallow trenches uh, dug in the ground that night prior to the battle. Um, the view from the lookout tower is the whole reason for the, the battle having been here. The Confederate Army knew that they'd be able to command that whole valley below. That really hasn't changed a whole lot since the battle. One of the items particularly in the museum there that is nice is a drum found by uh, three boys the morning after the battle. And you never know what you might just kick up walking around. Over the years we've we found bayonets, uh, a spur right here by the museum one day. But we've also got really nice hiking trails, a couple small caves, uh, overlook, uh, six-sided log lookout tower. Uh, also a great place just for a quiet walk in the woods. We have just short little trails, but they're, they're close to the roads. They're easy to get to. The whole purpose of the park here was to keep alive the memory of the men that fought here. These guys died here. I mean, that's. You know, they, they deserve to be remembered. And because of that, the people here became very real to me, and it's more than just a job of mowing the grass and take care of the buildings, you know, and so it's been a privilege of mine to, to share their stories.
We're at Dolly Sods, West Virginia. We've been banding here since 1958, when my father, Ralph Bell, started the banding station. He brought his family down, including me, and when I was a kid, and we watched Counted Hawks. He was a bird nut, I guess you could say. He had the fire, which is what he says about a lot of people that love what they're doing. A male, black to blue warbler. We came up about 14 years ago to get married on Bear Rocks, and we camped the two weeks before our wedding and met the bird banders and became fascinated with what they do. Holding uh, these little tiny birds in your hand within a week are gonna be in Mexico or South America, or some of them we could actually fly clear to Argentina, fly 7,000 miles one way. It's just, it's just amazing to be able to hold something like that in your hand and then watch it fly away. This is a natural bowl out here, which they try to find their way up this mountain. So they come to this bowl, come across, and redirect their self back southwest again. We have 30 nets, 20 south, and 10 north, and that's when they fly gently into the net, and it holds them, and we come and, and pull them out. Then we record all the information after we put the band on them. And we re release the bird immediately. We want to get them on their way because their purpose is to get south quickly. Most all the birds right now are migrating. Somehow God programs them to uh, know when to go. And we can get everything from a hummingbird to a hawk out of the nets, which is just fascinating. We do it because we love it. We all have the fire. I know he'd be thrilled to know you're here and able to share this uh, important thing we're doing with other people because uh, it meant so much to him. Foot golf basically originated in California. You do the same thing as golf, you don't play on the green, but we have uh, a regulation size soccer ball, a number five soccer ball. We have 21 inch cups. Instead of hitting a golf ball with a club, you kick a soccer ball with your feet and put it in the least amount of shots into the cup. There are more young people exposed to soccer in schools than they are in golf, and almost everybody can kick a ball. You know, it's more difficult to learn uh, golf and, and it can be very frustrating at times. This is something that is the best of both worlds. You're playing golf, but you're kicking a ball. You can just show up and play. We, we rent soccer balls. It's inexpensive to play and uh, you can bring your own soccer ball. The official color of foot golf is orange, but when you play foot golf, they, they ask you to dress a certain way. You don't have to quite naturally. You wear a, a Kangol hat, Argyle socks and preferably knickers. It's a reflection on golf and you have your soccer ball. That's the whole thing. It's to, it's to come out here and have fun. We're the first foot golf course in the state. We'd love to see more foot golf courses in the state. I think it's gonna be something that will take foothold here and, and spread.